Seven times he prayed, and it was the seventh time that his servant said, I see a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. Now I'm going to tie that in in just a little bit. The last opening scripture I want to read is Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 and 42. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says that he went a little farther and fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then it tells us something really interesting in verse 42. It says, And again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. So, here's the thing. When we talk about navigating obstacles in prayer. We talk about praying until the Holy Spirit gives us a peace or a release. Or when we talk about the strategies of prayer, it's important that we know that scripturally, prayer, it, it takes all different shapes, all different forms, and it isn't always a one-time deal. Amen? How many of you have had to pray about something more than once before you saw the answer? Okay? Only two. Maybe three. Four. Okay. All right. More hands are going up. People are, it's dawning on you what I asked. And so, even Jesus, even Jesus felt compelled to continue to petition the Father. Think about that for a second. Not once, but twice. He was, he was agonizing in the garden, asking the Father for something. The great man of God, Elijah, pray. This is the same Elijah that called down fire from heaven and, and saw the prophets of Baal killed, saw the sacrifices burned up. This same Elijah had to pray seven different times. Now, and this was not, by the way, this was not, oh Lord, we ask you for rain. Okay, go look. Not there. Oh Lord, we continue to ask you to rain. It says he, he went, we'll talk about this in the, I think the coming weeks. I don't remember if Pastor Michael or I are covering it, but we're going to talk about this, the prayer of travail. He was travailing. That, when it says he gathered up his cloths and he went down into a position, he was travailing like a mother giving birth. He was in deep prayer, but seven times, seven times it took for even the beginning of the answer to show forth. So what we see here is that there's some obstacles we need to learn to navigate in prayer. There's some things that help us to succeed. See, I grew up I grew up hearing a very, in my opinion, very oversimplified uh, rendition of how prayer works. That you pray and God either says yes or he says no or he says not now. Or maybe. Or maybe. <laughs> Or he just ignores you. <laughs> that was implied. I grew up, as simplistic as it sounds, I don't know if any of you grew up hearing about prayer that way. Well, you know, sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no, sometimes he says maybe, sometimes he says not now. Well, yeah, big picture, yeah. But it's not that simple. And he doesn't intend for it to be that simple. He intends... For prayer, remember what it is. It's a partnership with Him. Intercession is a partnership. It's that word pagah in the Hebrew, which means a meeting. It means we are striking a meeting with God and the earth to see breakthrough happen, to see His will exerted and come to pass. And so whether that takes one time or ten times or a hundred times or standing on my head in the corner, I want to do whatever it takes to see His will come to pass. I don't want to shrink back from that. And I don't want to say, well, He said no. I prayed once. I even prayed twice. And it didn't happen. You know? We, we miss it sometimes. And because we don't realize there are obstacles that we need to navigate. So real quickly, let's talk about, first of all, oh, personal obstacles. Did you know that you can be an obstacle in prayer? I can be an obstacle in prayer? We got to deal with this. Okay? We got to deal with this. So the first obstacle, and I can't give you a chapter and verse from the Bible of this, but I, irregularity in our own prayer life is a hindrance and an obstacle to prayer many times. Now please, don't take that to say that you can't ever run to the Father. 
We can always run to the Father. We always should run to the Father. We have a blood-bought, given right to go boldly before His throne of grace in our time of need. But here's the thing. If I'm irregular in prayer, what, what can happen in that? Talk to me. What can happen in my irregularity in personal prayer? Or maybe I'm irregular in joining in corporate prayer. How, what, what starts to slip in sometimes? Yeah. Our belief becomes weak. Okay. So we, our belief gets weakened. What else happens? Tiffany, you got anything? I'm picking on you. <laughs> tells us that our own lack of faith can be 
uh, an obstacle in prayer. You ever prayed for something, but you knew there was unbelief in your heart about it? It just seemed too, it just seemed too much. You knew you should pray about it. <laughs> you knew you should ask the Father for that. But it just seemed too much. And, and, and if we're not careful, that unbelief can hinder our ability to really move in faith. Because faith is the currency of heaven. It is, the, it is the means by which we transact with God. And so if we, if the best thing we can do when we recognize that is, is the case is like the Roman centurion. I believe, but help my unbelief, God. I've had to say that. Lord, I believe the best I know how I believe. But help any unbelief that I have in this situation because I want what you want. Another personal obstacle, if we're not careful, is that doubt can cancel out the effectiveness of our prayers. James chapter 1 verses 6 through 8 talks about that. It talks about when we're double-minded. That's another phrase for That's doubt. That double-mindedness, it says let that person, I mean, James, by the way, Gary, it's my favorite book of the Bible too. <laughs> yeah, it really is, since I was a young man. Um, uh, I mean, younger. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, James just really hits it right square on the nose. I mean, he says the double-minded person, let that person not expect anything. Right. That sounds harsh, but it's just true. It's just true. Like Miss Deanna's saying, if, if we're double-minded, we are vacillating between belief and doubt, belief and doubt, belief and doubt. That is going to put a major stall on God's answer coming into being, coming into manifestation. Yeah, that's good, Chris. And I just want to add that when you pray like that, if you're true, you cannot pray the prayer of faith if you're double minded. Mm -hmm. The two can't exist in the same room. That's you can't good. pray a prayer of faith going, God, I don't really know if you can do this or know if you will do it. That is ultimately doubting, which, you know, I hate to say it like that, but it kind of nullifies the prayer of faith. You're not really praying the prayer of faith. That's right. If you don't believe God will do it or can do it. Amen. That's true. That's true. That's true. Here's one. Oh my goodness, Lord have mercy on us and have mercy on me. We can dig up the seed of faith-filled prayer by canceling it out with our words later. Amen. That's so true. Say it. Oh my goodness. Lord, help this mouth. <laughs> we really need to be careful because we start off well many times praying in faith, praying in alignment with the Word. We're being led by the Spirit and then the first exceptional behavior that we see or the first thing that looks contrary to what we have prayed, we can just, you know, I don't understand, I don't know where that breaking point is, to be honest with you. I just know there can be one and we can really dig up that seed that's been sown in faith. And so we need to really watch the words of our mouth. We have the power of life and death in our tongues, the Bible says. And that applies to what we're praying as well. So when we pray for things in faith, it's so important that we guard our conversation that follows those prayers. Because there will be tests. I don't know. Have you ever been tested? You prayed something in faith, and then maybe it wasn't that day, maybe it was the next day, next week, next month, something happened, and it looked totally contrary to what you knew was the heart of God for a situation. We've got to be careful about that. That we can be the obstacle. Next is our pride. Our pride in James 4, 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You want to be an effective prayer warrior? Walk in humility. Impure motives. James, again, chapter 2, verses 3, 4, he says you ask for things, but you're asking for them for the wrong reasons or you're asking for them to spend them on yourselves, to gratify your flesh. And so that too can be an obstacle. And James is giving a discourse on what is effectual prayer and what is not effectual prayer. So we need to be careful about our motives in prayer as well. Wouldn't that be like praying to win the lottery? I mean, honestly, it could be. Say, Lord, I just believe <laughs> I'm going to get this ticket because I want to bless the kingdom of God. But God ultimately knows your heart. He does. You're not blessing the kingdom of God with what you already have in your hand. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. No, we, and, and you're right. God does know the intent and motives of our heart. And so that prayer, for one, may be a faith-filled prayer that God is spurring if He's giving you the release to go by and uh, partake.
partake. Uh, I remember we had the publisher's clearinghouse right after I got saved. I was a baby Christian. Mm-hmm. I was preaching, oh God, I'm going to bless your kingdom. Let me win the publisher's clearinghouse. Did you win it? No. Okay. <laughs> Peter 3 7, uh, husbands, treat your wives with honor and kindness and love so that your prayers are not hindered. Our pra- and it, but it goes both ways. <laughs> With whichever direction you are in in a spousal relationship, <laughs> we need to treat one another as the precious vessels that they are so that our prayers are not hindered. Let's just, you don't even have to raise your hand, but have you ever had a disagreement with your spouse and things are still simmering and not quite peaceable yet? Have you ever tried to pray in, the, in that moment? It doesn't happen. Woo, it just doesn't happen or it doesn't happen. Oh, what, you've had this moment? <laughs> I'm so shocked. Uh, <laughs> and so, <laughs> it, it, the, the, the prayer doesn't, May not happen at all, but if it does happen, it's probably not really in the spirit very well. So we have to be careful. The last, the last two personal obstacles are unconfessed sin. Okay, I want to turn to that one. So, Psalm sixty-six, Psalm sixty-six, and if somebody beats me there, I would be grateful. And someone go to Matthew chapter five. So Psalm sixty-six, verse verses sixteen through nineteen. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. So, again, does that mean God hears zero prayers when you're in walking in sin? Well, I hope not because one of those prayers is, God, forgive me, set me free. But if I am walking in a place of pride and self-righteousness and there are strongholds of sin in my life, there is, there is, a, there is a less open door <laughs> in heaven with the Father. Now, I, we could probably debate this a little bit theologically because this is Old Testament, the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all unrighteousness and we're told to come boldly before the throne of grace because of his blood. So I, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm recognizing that, I'm acknowledging that, but I do believe that when we are, when we have unconfessed sin, when we are regarding or holding iniquity in our heart, there is an impediment to our prayers. And lastly, did someone go to Matthew chapter 5? I hope if you did, raise your hand so I know who it is. I want to ask you to read. Did somebody read out of Matthew 5 out loud for us? Uh, 23 and 24. So then if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your gift. So the last personal obstacle is unforgiveness and offense. That's a big one. That's a big one. You know, I'm, I have learned and I have to relearn it at times that offense and unforgiveness can go deeper in our heart than we even recognize. Like, what I mean is I forgive you in the moment that something happens. I maybe later, I even am praying and I, I, I choose to forgive so and so. But there can still be some, some, some wounding there can still be some, some venom from what happened that's down inside. And what I've learned is that can totally influence my prayer life. It can really hinder it. It can become an obstacle. It can become an obstacle to whether I can pray for that person the way I need to pray for that person. Pastor Michael and I were talking about this, and he shared, I kind of, I'm going to drop a nugget that he dropped my way which is when we have truly forgiven someone, does not, let me tell you two things it doesn't mean. 
One, it doesn't mean you have to walk in a harmful situation or a destructive uh, situation again. So that's not what forgiveness means. And secondly, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are called to still walk with that person in the same way that you walked with them before. But here's the nugget Pastor Michael shared with me. I need to be able to see them. I need to be able to talk with them. I need to be able to love them in my heart. And I need to be able to pray for them. And there may have been more. That is the bar for forgiveness. That, there, it, it may even be higher than that. But that is a, that is a standard for us. And, and if we... I'm just being so real with you. You don't even know how real I'm being with you right now. <laughs> when I can't do that, then that is a red flashing light that something still needs the touch of God in my heart. That I still need to be able to pray for that person. You say, but yeah, but you know, they they did this or they did that. They're my, they're my sister. They're my brother. Okay. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's make it even more real. We're supposed to pray for our enemies. Right. How are we going to pray for our enemies if we can't even pray for our brothers or our sisters that we've had conflict with? Well, you know? That's right. So we've got, to, we've got to allow Holy Spirit to plumb the depths of our heart and our soul and let Him deal with that stuff so that we are not hindered in being His instrument. His instrument of love, his instrument of reconciliation, his instrument of intercession. Amen? Amen. All right. So those are some personal obstacles. Um, let's talk about just a few kind of bigger picture obstacles. I, I'm calling these things that we have to navigate in the spirit realm or things that we have to navigate in the corporate setting or things that we have to navigate when we're ministering to someone in prayer. And, and this list could be much longer. I'm just going to hit a few points. So one is, I've learned that when it comes to prayer, and, and if you've been here more than three or four times, this probably will not be a surprise to you because you've heard this from, not from me, you've heard this from others. But the atmosphere, there are spiritual atmospheres. Let me say that first of all, okay? There's, there's weather atmospheres. <laughs> there's climate atmospheres. There's spiritual atmospheres. The spiritual atmosphere of a region or a group of people or even a meeting can be something that needs to be navigated. Okay? So let me, let me give an instance. So when we come together for prayer corporately, think about what's just in the natural, what's happening there. People are coming from different places. People have had different days. Some people have had a great day. Some people have had an awful day. Some people slept great the night before. Some people were up half the night and didn't want to be, you know. And and then there. So we're all coming in at different levels. If we're if we're not if we do nothing to change this, right. which we should do something to change this, we come in and we're all at different places. Our heart, our mind. Even spiritually, we're, we're experiencing all kinds of different things. And then you add to that, that that we're in a place where things are not static. Have you learned that? Things are not static. I, I have learned that in my home, in general, there is a, an abiding peace and presence of God. Now, and I, and I know I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I, and, and I have a... Renee and I have a lot to do with that. But I have noticed, just a simple example, I've noticed that when we have house guests, or more specifically, when some of our children have had house guests, that that atmosphere can change. Like, boom, it can change. Like the next day or two days later, I realize that we're fussing, we're disagreeing, we're dealing with this, that, and the other. Something has changed. The, so spiritual atmospheres are not static. They're dynamic. 
They change. They change as people come in and out of them. They change as, as things are happening in the heavenlies, both through warfare, through blessing. They, they can shift for the positive, and they can shift for the negative. And it's amazed me, and I'll just use Youngsville and Glory Tabernacle as an example, and this is, this is um, through no fault. I mean, this is not a fault, and this is not a, a negative, but it's amazing how one meeting when we gather, we feel such an open heaven and such a, a, a closeness with the Lord and, and that anything's possible. And then we come back three nights later and it feels like the heavens have been shut in their brass. What, what's going on there? Well, it can be related to who's here. More likely, it can be related to what's been going on in the spirit realm. And whether there has been warfare, whether there have been assignments, because I do know this, I do know this very much, that those who walk with God and walk in the light of God draw negative attention in the spirit realm. Yes, we do. And so the brighter the glory, the brighter the bullseye. <laughs> and so we need to understand why I'm not going into all this, because when whether it's me settling down in my chair on the porch to pray, or whether it's me coming together with my brothers and sisters on a Wednesday night to pray, or whether it's having a home group meeting in my house on a Saturday and it's time to pray, I need to understand that the atmosphere is something that can influence and impede the direction we go. And so sometimes, well, many times, it doesn't have to be, be a big ordeal, but we there are things we can do to navigate that. There are things that, that I have learned that are powerful in setting the right kind of atmosphere. And so we do it, first of all, we do it through, through prayer. We bring everyone together on the same page. We focus on the Lord. We exalt the Lord. We don't exalt the warfare. We exalt the Lord first and foremost. Amen? I mean, it doesn't mean we won't go into warfare, but we exalt the Lord. We magnify His name. Oh, come, magnify the Lord with me. So we magnify His name, and we also recognize that we need His presence. We need the angels of heaven coming in. You'll hear me pray sometimes. I'm, not, I'm no expert, but you'll hear me pray sometimes. I w I'm not just doing it to be polite. I'm not just doing it to be spiritual. I welcome the angels of heaven. I welcome the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I welcome the cloud of witnesses. I welcome the seven spirits of God. Almost any time I'm in a corporate meeting, whether I do it from the front or I do it from my seat, I do that. Why? Because that is a shifting agent to the presence of God and the atmosphere where we're gathering. And, and here's why that's important. Because when there is a cap and a lid, and we're not experiencing the open heaven that we have a right to through Christ, then we are impeded in our prayers. Have you ever said this? It feels like the heavens are brass. Have you ever said that saying? Or it feels like my prayers are not getting past the ceiling. Have you ever said things like that? Well, there's a reason for that. And usually it is because of the atmosphere. It's because of what's going on in a meeting or a gathering or even in my own heart. So there's a lot we can do. We can begin, and here's the thing that I learned. I, no offense, you, you'll, you'll like what I'm about to say. I think you're going to like what I'm about to say. Here's the, here's the great thing. I don't need Pastor Michael to do that. I'd love for him to do that, and he usually will. I know this guy. He will do it. But I can do it, right? Right over there, wherever I'm sitting, I can begin to say, Father, I just pray that you rend the heavens and come down. Yeah. Father, I pray right now that you, that you destroy the works of darkness. I pray for your glorious light to become. See, you, we are barometers in the spirit realm. Each of us, not, not just the fivefold ministry. Each of us are barometers in the spirit. And so when you, too often what happens if we don't have an empowered mindset in Christ. See, Christ is the most empowering factor in anybody's life. If you want to talk about breaking off victim mentality, just understand who you are in Christ. That is a huge first step. And so we come into situations and we feel, oh, the atmosphere was so heavy today. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, be 
empowered as a son and a daughter of God and begin to shift it and pray. Yes, some mantles can shift it a little bit quicker and more effectively. And some people who've been given roles of influence and authority and leadership, yes, they should be doing that. But you know who you are in Christ. Begin to shift that thing. I hate terrible prayer meetings. I do. I'd rather be at home. I hate terrible prayer meetings. They're not, the, you know, oh, at least we have to pray. No, I don't like terrible prayer meetings. I want meetings that are effectual, fervent, and accomplish much. And so we move in our authority to shift the atmosphere and to begin to deal with anything that God is revealing. You say, well, I don't, I don't see in the spirit. I don't hear like so-and-so. That's okay. You sense, right? You sense. You're a spiritual barometer. And so when you sense that something is off, let's begin to address it because that is going to allow the prayers that are happening in that moment to catch fire and to become extremely effectual and fervent. Amen? I wish people would do that in church services. Well, and you know, and we're all learning. We're all learning. And, and, and those of us who, who have been given you know, the responsibility of leadership at times, it's important that we lead people in that because people don't always... Ah. I'm just talking with you. This is like, y'all can just listen to Pastor Mike when I talk. <laughs> hey, hi, sweetie. And so, um, <laughs> and so, you know, not everybody's realizing what's going on. And that's okay because, again, maybe they had a flat tire on the way to church. Maybe they, maybe that's all they could do to get here. You know, and I really, I've, I've been there myself sometimes. So it's important that we help people to understand that. You, you know, Pastor Gary and Pastor Michael, it's important we help people understand what's happening. And you, you guys are really good at that, by the way, in my opinion. But we have the opportunity to teach while leading and while setting the atmosphere correctly. Amen? All right, I got to move on. Okay, got to go, got to go, got to go. All right, so here's the thing. This even affected Jesus' ministry. I know we're talking about prayer, but listen to this. Matthew 13, 58. Now, he, meaning Jesus, did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Where's there? You remember where there is? His hometown, Nazareth. And then if you go back and read this passage, you should go back and read this passage if you haven't read it recently. Read Matthew 13 in the 50s. It, it's not like they were mealy-mouthed and critical the whole time. They were amazed. It says they were astonished by him. They went, it was like Palm Sunday before crucifixion. I mean, yeah, it was like Palm Sunday before the triumphal entry before crucifixion on Friday. It, they, were, they were amazed at his teaching. They were amazed at his revelation. But then it says they got offended and began to turn against him. And as they got offended, and as they began to turn against him, it says that they shifted into unbelief. So that's an important thing for us to understand. That our ability, that when there is offense, that that leads to unbelief. When there is offense in a meeting, that leads and lends itself to unbelief. When there is offense in a marriage, that leads to unbelief. When there is offense in a relationship, that leads to unbelief. And that is so important because their unbelief prevented Jesus from doing many mighty miracles in Nazareth. He was the Son of God. He was the Son of God. And yet unbelief among the people, the atmosphere of that town was so anti-Christ in that moment that he was even limited in what he was able to do. That's... That's mind-blowing to me. It's just as mind-blowing as it is that they were exclaiming how wonderful he was right before that happened. <laughs> so that, that, big picture, we need to understand that we need to navigate these circumstances. We need to understand that when there's offense. We need, how do you say, how do you know that? You discern it. You discern it. You listen to the Holy Spirit. And frankly, watch people's faces. Renee and I, Renee and I used to, you know, we, Renee and I used to lead, um, we started off as a home group meeting, then it became a, maybe a full
full-fledged church. Some people would argue that it wasn't a full-fledged church. I thought it was a full-fledged church. <laughs> and then we became a house church after that. Hi, sweetie. Hi, darling. You going to stand up here? And so we, we, you know, we got to experience prayer and worship in these different settings. And I tell you, and, and I wish I could tell you I did a better job. Be careful, okay? And so I wish I could tell you I did a better job at this, but I saw multiple, I, was, I had a front row seat sometimes to see meetings going in the toilet because of people's, some people had a fence. Ooh, and that was a hard, that was a hard nut to crack. Right, you know? Yeah. All right, come on, sweeties. Let's come down. Come on, let's come down. Yeah, let's go see Mama. Sit back here. I want you to watch your step. Come on. You got it? All right. So, we need to learn to navigate spiritual obstacles. Here's another reason, here's another obstacle when we're praying. Are you, is this, are you guys okay? Are we, are we together still? All right. Okay, good. Situation and navigate to that. 
with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's how we see breakthrough. So if you feel like you're hitting your head up against the wall, sometimes, sometimes we're, we're hitting good things, important topics, but we haven't gotten to the root yet. And so sometimes that can be related to deliverance that we need. Sometimes it can be a mindset that has just become very entrenched and it needs changing. There's many things that can contribute there, but Holy Spirit wants to lead us, again, Romans 8, 26, to the prayer that ought or should be prayed for a given situation so that we are finding breakthrough and we're finding victory. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to keep going. Here's another obstacle that we have to deal with, both personally but also corporately, and it's this. It's disobedience. Disobedience. What do I mean by that? Well, I am a big believer in corporate prayer that everybody is potentially a part of the solution. Okay? Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when we're praying, and we're tackling topics like think our nation, or our state, or the, the destiny of this ministry, or what God's doing in Youngsville. I'm a big believer that God can use any person present to bring forth a puzzle piece that makes our prayers effectual and fervent, that hits the nail on the head. And so it's important that we be obedient when God gives you that puzzle piece. So I'm going to pick on my wife because she gets a lot of puzzle pieces. She gets a lot of puzzle pieces. But she sometimes says, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I say, well, you don't have to know what that means. I say it in love, don't I? I say, yeah, I do. I say, you don't have to know what that means, honey. You just need to share it. Bring your puzzle piece forward because someone else has the connecting puzzle piece. And when we get two or three of those puzzle pieces out in front of us, it's called revelation. I thought that was pretty good. It's called <laughs> revelation. One puzzle piece may not be revelation. Two puzzle pieces may not be revelation. But three puzzle pieces in this situation is revelation. And all of a sudden, we know what it is we're supposed to pray. All of a sudden, we know what the strong man is. All of a sudden, we know what the principality is that we're dealing with. But it, it takes obedience. It takes willingness for each of us. My wife is so good at sharing these things, by the way. I'm, I'm picking on her, but she's really good at sharing these things. And, and, I, and I appreciate her gifting in that. But I, I'm using her because I... I I think she'll forgive me. And so I'm using her as an example. And so it's important that we each bring forth the puzzle piece. When we used to have home, this, way back in the day, we had home meetings with uh, Mama D and Frank. And I mean, that was one of my favorite things is the puzzle pieces coming forward. Just the puzzle pieces. And, and we, we just got comfortable with it. I don't, here, here was, the, here was all, almost always the preface. I don't know what this means, but <laughs> we got to get comfortable with that in order. These things need to happen in order when we're in large gatherings. And Pastor Michael, I think, is very good at helping us to be in order with those things when it's time. But we bring forth the treasure that he's deposited in us because I can't see what Carolyn can see. And I can't see what Tiffany may be seeing. But I need to know what they're seeing. I need that revelation. I need that, that insight that God has dropped in them in that moment because that could be the taproot that needs to be dealt with. And so, why am I saying this again? Because when we don't do that, it's called disobedience. Now, I'm not, Renee likes to ask me this, well, is everything I see supposed to be shared? Well, probably not everything. Yeah, we're, we're still working this one out. <laughs> but here's the thing. The, and, and this is just, um, it's just my, the wisdom and the light that God's given me. If he's showing me in the corporate setting, then I tend to think it's for sharing or for the benefit of the corporate gathering. I tend to think that way. When, in prayer. In prayer. When we're, and, and again, remember, it's a, we're on assignment when we're praying. We're accomplishing things. So the, it, I like to think of it as a mission. 
We need to understand what the mission is. And we understand more and more what the mission is through the gifting of revelation that each of us can flow in in the right moments. And so one person gets a vision, another person hears a word, another person discerns this in the spirit realm. And we bring those things together in the prayer meeting so that we are effectually and fervently hitting the right points. I get so excited when it happens. It's, it's wonderful when it happens. But we need to be obedient. We need to be willing to flow with the Holy Spirit. The last thing that can really become an obstacle, uh, it's not the last thing, it's just my last thing in my notes, is moving in our flesh. Moving in our flesh or, or speaking out of our soul. Now, I really believe this is important because I, and I've done it myself, there's a lot of people who are very anointed, very gifted, who can speak or minister or pray under that, that gifting, that anointing, but it can it, it's not so much that the anointing lifts, it's just we don't recognize when we're supposed to be done. Does that make sense? When there's times, the, the best thing you can do when you're praying in in a corporate setting and you're or prophesying in a corporate setting or whatever God's prompting you to do is to do what he told you to do and then stop and just stop it's okay it doesn't matter if it was one sentence just stop Amen. and then if he gives you another sentence go right ahead but we all have seen it <laughs> we've all been there we've all seen it huh what's that we've all seen it where we, we or someone is, is ministering, they're speaking, they're prophesying, and they're, they're in a flow, they're, they're ministering under the unction of the Holy Spirit, and then it shifts. I even, one of, the, one of the national prophetic ministers that Renee and I really, really appreciate and esteem very highly, very, even he himself called himself, uh, the other Sunday we were listening to him, Minister. I mean, he was in such a prophetic flow, such a prophetic stream. And then he started getting on to these little side topics. And I, I actually didn't recognize, I didn't realize he had gotten out of the flow. And then, he, and then he stopped himself. He said, I don't know what I'm doing. He said, I wasn't supposed to touch on those topics. He said, I, I got off track. I'm sorry. I mean, he was hitting, it wasn't like he was saying anything false. It wasn't that he was say anything unbiblical, you know, it, it was it was good stuff. But he himself recognized the unction had ceased about two or three minutes before, but he kept going. And he but I respected him so much he called himself out, <laughs> apologized, and said, I need to get back into what the Lord's having me speak to you about right now. We need to do that too, personally. All right, so I've got probably more than we have time for, even though I got handed the microphone at 8.30, <laughs> which I wouldn't trade for a minute. It was an awesome, awesome time. Um, yeah, maybe we do a part two. Maybe do a part two, and it might be next week, or we'll, we'll talk and see what, when it works out. But I, do, I wanted to... Here's what, what part two will include, all right? A little teaser. I, I want to talk about sensing the release of God when you're praying. I actually really have some things that are really stirring in my heart about that. How to know when to sense the release of God. And, and I put in parentheses, when is it enough? When have I prayed enough about something? And then I want to talk about the other thing was prayer strategies. Just the the practical applications of strategy and prayer. Sounds like a good part two. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Man. So, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to part three of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, just to recap, there, there's obstacles that we can face that can slow our progress in prayer or hinder the outcomes. I, I don't want to say God can't move around those and work around those. And here's something that I'm so glad about. If I, I, 
I've been prompted to share a word sometimes, and I debated, and I was like, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure. It wasn't an unwillingness, it was more like, I don't know, I'm not sure. And then, lo and behold, 5, 10, 15 minutes later, so somebody else stands up, they, they don't say it exactly how I was hearing it, but they say the same message. I'm so glad that God doesn't just say, well, I'm just going to sit here and tap my fingers and look at my watch waiting on Chris. He's like, nope, I've got a willing vessel over here. Amen. <laughs> so God is yeah. not, I mean, we can be an obstacle, but at the same time, God is not limited to just one Amen. of us. <laughs> right. And so that's a good news thing. Right. That's a good news thing. That's what it means to be a part of the body, that, that we've got brothers and sisters who can be used. It, it, we still should be striving to be in the flow. We still should be striving to move with the unction of the Holy Spirit. And we need to learn to navigate those personal obstacles that can hinder our prayers, but also navigate those obstacles that can hinder our effectiveness when we go into corporate prayer. Um, but the good news is, is God's really gracious and He's very forgiving. And he is, He's more committed to seeing His plan come to pass than even I am. He's more committed to your destiny than even you are. That's good news for some of us tonight. Amen. 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 Well, let's just pray. Uh, you want to stand up? You've been sitting for a while, listening for a while. This could be your stand up, and I'm heading toward the door. <laughs> so, Holy Spirit, uh, thank you so much. You're our teacher. You're our counselor. And we are so grateful that you've been speaking to us, not not because of me and not through me, Lord, but I just trust you've been speaking to us. You've been showing us the things that we need to know. And we thank you, Lord. We pray, God, that the words of that have been voiced tonight, the ones that truly were of you and, and by the unctioning of the Holy Spirit, that they would stick within us and that they would go down deep and that they would bring forth good fruit and abundant fruit in our prayer lives in our relationships, in our effectiveness as servants of you, God. Father, we thank you. Help us to be even more discerning and sensitive in the Spirit. We ask right now, even God, we ask for increased discernment. Yes, increased discernment. Yes, discerning of spirits, but also just discerning your heart, discerning your voice, discerning your ways. Help us to be discerning when it comes to the, what you're doing in the body and doing in our gatherings. Yes. And we ask, Lord, that you would make us pliable in your hands. We just, once again, afresh and anew, say we're willing, we're available, and we desire to be obedient to you, God. We want to be used by you so that your plans can come to pass, so that your will can be done on earth as it is in heaven, God. And we thank you for the privilege to pray tonight. We thank you for an awesome, awesome time with you tonight, God. So wonderful. We can't say thank you enough, Lord. As Miss Marie said, 10,000 tongues would not be enough. We just can't say thank you enough, God, for the intensity and the splendor of your presence tonight and, the, and all the things that you did that we both saw and have yet to see and appreciate. We thank you for them, Lord. Now I pray for each of us, God, as we go from this place tonight. We ask for your traveling mercies. We thank you for every promise in Psalm 91. I declare them over us in our households, that your angels have charge over us, and that as we abide in you, we are hidden in the secret place of the Most High. We thank you, Father God, that we do not fear and will need not fear any arrows that fly by us or any pestilence or any attacks or any wickedness that would try to come near our dwelling tonight. And we thank you for safety on the road. We thank you for peace in our homes, peace in our sleep tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, we say amen together. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thanks, Carson.